This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. All right. Welcome back, everyone, to Cosmographia Podcast with Randall Carlson. We are the Snake Brothers, Russ and Kyle. We're here with Mike and Brad and Randall. How are y'all doing out there? Excellent. I am I'm here. doing better this week than I was last week. I was, <clears throat> well, here I go again. I just had a little bit of a hoarse throat last week, left over from um, a cold. I had my, my November cold that I seem to get like clockwork every year. It must be something about the latitude of North Georgia. Somewhere, just in time to go to Little Rock. Just in time to go to Little Rock, exactly. And, and, and have to, to speak. And have to speak, exactly. <laughs> but, um, yeah, much better now. And uh, ready well, Mike, to go. You're, you're there in Georgia, too. How are you feeling? I'm fine. I, I actually am getting over about a pneumonia. I had pneumonia a couple of weeks ago. Oh man! Oh, that's where I got it from. Well, thanks, Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate but, yes, that. Yes, much, much better now. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So, so, Mike. So, yeah. Here, you you were dealing with something probably the same time I was. Yeah. Okay. Well. All right. Well, we're really looking forward to getting back into the uh, younger Dryas. Uh, that period uh, we were talking about the megafaunal extinction events, and mm-hmm. we were. Um, and we were we've been talking a, a bit about the circumstances under which the uh, fossilized carcasses are being found. Now, Kyle, do you remember the term taphonomy? Very good. All right, hey, you're hey, hey. getting an attaboy for that. All right. <laughs> yeah, I was <clears throat> I was going to be deeply disappointed if you didn't remember that, Kyle. Man, I, would, I would have been too. I, I'm I glad you didn't ask me because. <laughs> You could name that tune in less than two <laughs> syllables. I, I, okay, I actually am, you know, working here. I've been taking notes um, on some of these terms and, and getting the definitions. I'm trying to, uh, you know, Keep commit up. those to memory. So I, I ordered the book you suggested. As well. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the Geological Dictionary? Yes. Yeah, it's very helpful. It's got thousands of terms. I've used this for years. I'll go ahead and plug it. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah plug this it. This is what I use. Um, when I need to look up a term and you can see it's quite a fat book and has a yeah. lot of terms in it All right. more than I could memorize. I'm trying. Well, and we're, and we're <laughs> close to setting, yet. we're close to setting up a store so we can post these books that you offer and then people can purchase them through our little storefront and, uh, that'll, <clears throat> that'll, that'll boost our income and, uh, people get this information that you tell them they need, uh, they need to be digging into. So, yeah, that's, that's another, another item that will be going in the store. Excellent. All right. So, yeah, taphonomy then is the study of what happens between the point, the, 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 the death of a living animal and its interment into the, as part of the fossil record. What are those processes? And there's a multiplicity of processes. Obviously, the processes that affect a, a, a a late Ordovician marine environment are not necessarily going to be the same processes that uh, cause the uh, the death assemblages of the Pleistocene megafauna, but it's still the same idea. What occurs in that window of time there? So I'm very interested in the circumstances in which the Pleistocene megafauna are found. I'm I'm fascinated by all of these great nonlinear events within the stratigraphic history of life on earth um and that includes you know the mass extinction events but i'm especially interested in the most recent one um which was the terminal pleistocene megafaunal extinction that occurred around 12 to thirteen thousand years ago now depending on whose studies you look at it could be a thing that's drawn out over three or four or five thousand years or it could be something that's very closer to instantaneous I think that the model that makes the most sense to me is that you might have had a couple of pulses, episodes of uh, mass mortality, but you had survivors. The problem is, is that when we begin to understand how drastically 
the environment of planet Earth changed in that transition from Pleistocene to Holocene, whether it took 2,000 years or 5,000 years, is almost irrelevant because the, the extent of the changes that we're talking about here and the geological time spans that we're talking about are, ins are insignificant. But the changes are very significant. And one of the things that involved, of course, was complete alteration of existing biomes, complete rearrangement of existing ecosystems. And so there may have been what we may be needing to look at is, I'll use the term bimodal, a bimodal event where you had slower extinction events, but superimposed upon that a couple of very extreme pulses of mortality. And I think that is going to be the more uh, realistic scenario. One end is a very, to me, maybe oversimplified that, boom, they're all gone in an instant, right? Some of the critics of the impact hypothesis for um, as, as, a, as a factor in the mass extinction are invoking what to me is an oversimplified scenario, a kind of a straw man scenario and saying, well, we don't see the evidence that they all disappeared in, in one day or one week. Therefore, it was not impact related, right? But I think that's oversimplified and unrealistic because I think what we're seeing here is a series of episodes whose cumulative effect was this massive alteration of the planetary ecosystem. Within that sequence of events, you had several pulses of mass mortality, and then you had more protracted episodes of mortality because of the fact that you had surviving species that were either varying degrees of successfully adapting to these dramatically altered ecologies. The ones that managed to adapt Basically, the, the evidence that they adapted was that they proliferated and they're, they're still extant rather than extinct, whereas a lot of species went extinct. And, and, you know, these are the ones we've been talking about the last couple of episodes here. We've been looking at the idea of the, the mammoths and the mastodons and the ground sloths and, and this amazing fauna, the, the, the American Pleistocene lion that was the size of a horse, the giant camels, the, the dire wolves, the list goes on and on and on. It seems to be an effort that if we're going to say, well, they didn't all go extinct at precisely the same time, therefore, it couldn't have been any kind of an impact event. See, that's kind of what it, the, the, how, where the, the, the criticism kind of plays out to, to that level, right? Whereas I go so far as to speculate, and this is, of course, speculation, that we are looking at a multiple a multiple episode of event that maybe took a total of about 3,000 years. And we brought up the idea of the meltwater pulses. Earliest meltwater pulse is now dated at 14,600 years ago. I think there might be reason to question that dating, but for now I'm, I'm going to accept it, right? Then we have the younger driest boundary at 12,000, I forget the exact number now, but between 12,008 and 12,900 years ago. And then we have Meltwater Pulse 1B, which is dated 11,600 years ago, which is also the date that is now given for the, uh, the, the, the inception of the Holocene, the modern epoch that, that we now find ourselves in. So I find it interesting that there is this correlation between these things. And I'm of the, the matter that we might be looking at, in a sense, kind of a perfect storm of things. In a more modern uh, context, if we look at, um, say, the eruption of Tambora back in 1815, right, that, that led to the subsequent year without a summer in 1816, there were two things that sort of mutually reinforced each other. One was the volcano itself and the, the massive emissions of, of sulfate aerosols and, and dust and ash into the global atmosphere that acted as a canopy uh, preventing um, solar the same, the, the typical amount of solar radiation to penetrate, right? But at the same time, we're in this maunder minimum, we're in this, this phase of, of lowered solar activity. So when you had the, 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 the lowered solar activity coupled with um, the volcanic eruptions, well then of course, 
it it can be more extreme. And as as we commented before, you know, historians have, who've looked at that episode and and the the famines that were generated during that that summer of eighteen sixteen, because there were there were were repeated crop failures. Uh, because in fact, there were three, like in, in Northern United States, there were three frosts over the summer. There would be a frost that would kill off the, 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 the young crops, then they would replant, and then another frost would come along and kill off the plants again. So you had a lot of mass starvation. It's been called the last great subsistence crisis of Western civilization. And, and I think we're seeing the tandem effects of the cumulative effects of volcanoes and solar. And I think that we can be looking at events, and I think we're also going to be finding out as we go forward with this that many of these kinds of events are interlinked. I mean, we'll talk about this, but there is some very interesting evidence out there which suggests that impact type events can induce volcanism, right? So if that's the case, if it's the case, and that's that's an if, I'm not proclaiming it as, as settled science because it's not, but if it is the case, and there is evidence that seems to suggest a correlation right? A correlation between um, enhanced impact activity and enhanced volcanic activity. And David Alton and a number of other geologists have actually published on this. And, and, and you know, I think Michael Rampino and several others, I could probably pull up their references. Um, but the idea is that perhaps these great impacts or impact events exogenically can trigger uh, a um, an endogenic response, and I think that's be a very interesting potential uh, line of study and research for the next couple of decades. Is this relationship between what's going on out there and what's going on down below us? And it could turn out also that the sun is playing a role. That if the sun's um, activity changes, there could be a an endogenic response in the Earth. And there's some interesting research now that is now that is showing and suggesting that the entire solar system is essentially acting as a unitary system. And it's also being modulated by forces from outside the solar system that could be um, literally a galactic level. And this is some of the where I'd like to take some of this discussion as, as we proceed through these podcasts. But for tonight, we'll continue up with this idea of, of looking at this most recent event, because obviously the most recent event events within the history of these kinds of catastrophic things is going to have the most uh, evidence preserved that we can study directly and learn from. Um, obviously, like when we go, <clears throat> when you go back in time, we can talk about the great five mass extinctions in Earth history. And the most recent of the great five, of course, was the Cretaceous tertiary of uh, roughly 66 million years ago that saw the end of the dinosaurs. Well, when we go back from there, we go back from the, the Cretaceous tertiary and we get to the Triassic-Jurassic extinction. We go back from there and we get to the Permian-Triassic. So the Triassic is actually bookended by these two incredibly intense events. Um, mass extinct, two of the great mass extinctions in the history of, of planet Earth. The Permian-Triassic uh, that, that ended the, the, the um, permian times into the Triassic and then the catastrophe that ended the Triassic. When you go back from there, we find that in the late Devonian, there was a series of, of, of catastrophic episodes. They weren't as intense as the, as the Permian Triassic or as intense as the Cretaceous tertiary, right? Of all of those mass extinctions, the Cretaceous tertiary is, is the most settled science as to cause. And in the agreement is pretty much that it was triggered by this at least one massive impact that created the Chicxulub crater, which is now buried under the Yucatan Peninsula. But there's also evidence that they're clustered around there were a number of other impacts, and some of them pretty sizable. Indian geologists have looked uh, and found evidence of a crater on, uh, they refer to a Shiva on the floor of the Indian Ocean that looks to be in a pretty significant crater. And so a lot of the critics initially to the impact hypothesis for the extinction of the dinosaurs said, well, we can see that some species of dinosaurs that were already stressed or some species had already gone extinct, right? So therefore, there was no catastrophe. I don't read it that way. I read it that, yeah, what we're actually seeing now is that we could be looking at a juxtaposition of multiple catastrophes playing out over time, which brings us to a model that I think we need to be looking at, which is the idea that 
that impacts can be randomly spread through time, but they can also be clustered. And that's a very important idea, I think, that, that there could be bombardment episodes where the um, probabilities of Earth being impacted increase maybe by several orders of magnitude. And that, again, is something we're going to explore as we move forward through these, through these discussions and through these podcasts. So in the Devonian, the late Devonian, what we see is that the, there was no episode of mass mortality to the same degree as we find in the Permian Triassic or we find in the um, uh, Triassic Jurassic or like we find in the Cretaceous tertiary. But what we see is it's actually spread out more and there seems to have been multiple episodes of, of mass death that then ended with, um, you know, a major loss of uh, extant species that, that had endured throughout the Devonian. Go back beyond that, I think we get to the oldest of the great five, the, the, the terminal Ordovician. Very severe. But, but one of the, the points I'm trying to make here is as we go back, each one gets a little harder to discern and, and, and tease out the kinds of proxy evidence that could really tell us what happened. But if we do look, what, it seems that in each of the cases, and we, we, we certainly are going to talk about this in, in much greater detail. I'm actually writing up a whole series about this right now. In each of these cases, we find very convincing evidence for massive volcanism, right? The Permian-Triassic mass extinction, was associated with the formation of the Siberian Traps, which is this massive uh, basaltic uh, eruption, extrusive eruption, that buried about six to seven million square miles of what is now Siberia, right? Now, that much basaltic lava being spewed out is going to really pollute the atmosphere with a lot of really exotic stuff, most especially the sulfate aerosols. And it's going to trigger acidic rain on a on a really potent level, we find also, so we find that, we find with the Triassic-Jurassic um, extinction, there was the um, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, which was another huge volcanic outflow, right? When we get to the Cretaceous tertiary, we've got the, um, the Deccan Traps of India. And uh, exactly, again, this massive outflow of basaltic lava and releasing into the global atmosphere all of these all of these various uh, substances that can then l linger in the atmosphere for decades in addition to the the ash um, <clears throat> and and the particulate matter you've also got the gases right so but in addition to that just like at the Cretaceous tertiary we see that there appears to have been two factors involved Gigantic volcanism, gigantic impact, right? Both of those are well established. What are the relative roles of each of those? It's still being worked out. But it's clear that both of them would have had a profound effect on the stability of the planetary ecosystem. And when we go back to the Ordovician, when we come forward to the Devonian, we come forward to the uh, Triassic, to the Permian Triassic, then to the Triassic Jurassic. In every case, there is evidence, not proof, but evidence of some type of an extra, uh, extraterrestrial uh, fingerprint, usually in the form of iridium, platinum, or shocked quartz. Those seem to be the three, but, but not in the levels that we find at the KT and our Cretaceous tertiary boundary, because at that level, it's pretty well concluded that there is a correlation between the extraterrestrial proxy deposition and the sudden and total demise of many species of late Cretaceous dinosaur. As we go back, it gets harder to make, make those subtle comparisons where we can say, well, the volcanism played this role, impacts played this role. But I think what we need to be looking at, though, again, is that impacts may be the, the ultimate trigger. The impacts are, the, the shock and the force of an impact induces instabilities into the Earth's crust that's propagated through the mantle, and there could most likely, and this is not a totally fringe idea. It's out there being looked at by some major, major academic uh, people that there could be um, a, a very significant 
uh, response, endogenic response in the form of volcanism and seismicity. And we should definitely get into that. But so my point, I guess, in all this, two points here. One is that when we start looking at catastrophes, the problem is, is each catastrophe tends to rearrange the planet so much that it obscures the evidence for the earlier catastrophes, right? That's a part of it. Also, the idea that once you start looking at it, you realize that these catastrophes are a lot more prevalent than had really been assumed even a generation ago. And we also see this idea of thresholds that, that, you know, that something can happen. Earth had a cosmic encounter in June 30th, 1908. Didn't cause a mass extinction, right? Uh, didn't, didn't decimate half of the ha half of the globe or anything like that. It was just basically a pinprick. It was a cosmic pinprick yet that cosmic pinprick. Now from that, we can, extrapolate and go, well, what would happen if we encountered a swarm of Tunguskas, Tunguska type? And, and, and that is a very plausible model. It's been, it's one that's been developed by the British neocatastrophists for what, 30 years anyway. Um, you guys should probably know about this, the book by Victor Klub and William Napier that came out in 1980 called The Cosmic Serpent. And basically that idea was that the serpent, serpent was a metaphor for these cosmic visitations. And uh, that idea is they've been developing that idea ever since. Um, we got a, a great comment from Bill Napier onto the, uh, on, onto uh, George Howard's website uh, after that last Joe Rogan podcast. All right. Uh, where we were debating. Um, so he, he knows about what, what we're doing. I don't know if he's a member of the Comet research team or not, but I think he is. But, but in any ways, these guys have been doing really important and valuable work and developing this model really that, that, that puts the planet that we inhabit into a much larger cosmic ecosystem. And so I think we really need to be looking in that context in order to understand these great sweeping changes that have engulfed the, this planet repeatedly. And of course, then the most recent one, which I would basically think of as a global extinction event is, is the one that occurred at the last ice age. Now, I notice sometimes, sometimes people get a little confused. We're talking about like, for example, during the, 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 the Permian Triassic, we're talking about maybe 90% of all species on earth went extinct, but we're, we're, we're talking about all species and, and the, the, the dominant number of species that went extinct were actually marine species rather than uh, terrestrial species. Right. When we're looking at the Cretaceous tertiary, we're looking at about three quarters of all species, right? And again, with the, with the Triassic Jurassic, maybe, maybe somewhere between three quarters and, and 90%, right? Well, <clears throat> we're talking all species. When we look at the Pleistocene Holocene transition and the mass extinction of the megafauna, that doesn't even really rank as one of the great five. And the reason is we're talking about obviously the disappearance of half the megafauna of the planet is going to be an extraordinary event. It's going to be an extreme event. But in terms of total number of species, it's relatively insignificant. And significant is, is that basically what we see is a decapitation of the top of the food chain, right? And we see a loss of maybe 50% 50, uh, 50 of megafauna species globally, worldwide. Okay, what caused that? So this is, this is what we've been talking about. And this is the, 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 the question that I think we need to address in the, in the, in the quest to understand um, the great mass extinctions through earth history and these great nonlinear events, these event nodes, if you want to think of it that way, um, this is the most recent. <clears throat> and there's some very uh, useful parallels between that are emerging between what happened 12 to 13,000 years ago and what happened 66 million years ago. In its, in its own way, it's, they're almost sort of like bookends of the Cenozoic. But we'll get into some of those specifics. What I want to get back to is this, the conditions under which we find these megafauna. Um, and there seems to be some consistency there, and I brought this up last week. We'll, we'll look at this one here. Um, and this, this is just an example. Um, of literally hundreds and hundreds 
that I've collected together. Um, Brad and I, I guess it was 2001, we went up along the Bow River. We didn't go to this site, but we were up along the Bow River looking for, which is, which is a river that flows eastward out of the Canadian Rockies, out onto the prairies of Alberta. And what was interesting about the Bow River was it was apparently a conduit for, for massive meltwater floods. And so we were looking to document a ripple train that has been uh, observed up there on the, uh, on the gravel terraces along the, the Bow River. But what's interesting about those gravel terraces is that they have served to be a repository for many of these extinct mammals from the late Pleistocene. So uh, in this case, this was, um, goes back to 1968. Um, C.S. Churcher, this was published in the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences. And I'm sure everybody listening has probably are regular readers of the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences. Um, so here's what it says. This is the gravel deposits on the second major terrace above the north bank of the Bow River at Cochrane, Alberta, have been known by the local inhabitants to yield the bones of large mammals. Now, in this terrace, we're talking about gravel deposits. We're talking about flat, shelf-like features that flank the present-day river. And these flat um, features are composed of gravel, right? Uh, and when they say gravel, that also includes boulders. Now, you know that the, 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 the transition between a gra gravel and boulder is about 12 inches. I think that's about the size of a soccer ball, right? So once you get to 12 inches, you're now talking about a boulder, not gravel. But embedded all throughout these, um, these gravel deposits are much larger rocks that would be categorized as boulders. So anyways, they're talking about these terraces. And, and, and we'll, we'll explain here how, how these terraces work when we get to, uh, into the episodes about mega floods. Right? We'll explain the, the genesis of these flat terraces in, in these shelf like you, you almost have to picture the modern river but then there are these flat shelf like features uh sometimes they can be a single pair sometimes they can be multiple two or even three pairs of these shelves right and they are composed of gravels and they are a legacy of uh, uh enormously augmented flows through these through these valleys so this, the gravel deposits on the second major terrace above the north bank of the bow river at cochrane alabama alberta not Alabama, have been known by the local inhabitants to yield the bones of large mammals. These bones have been recovered from two series of pits, that's gravel pits, you know, they go in and you quarry the gravel and you use it to make primarily concrete out of and road building and so on. So when they're, when they're excavating these pits in this gravel to recover this gravel, what they do is they keep finding the remains of these extinct animals. And it is from these pits that the materials described here have been obtained. The body of an axis is recognizably from a small equid, that's a horse. The specimen is water-worn and lacks all of the neural arch. Now, and here's, here's the critical part. Carbonized patches are present on the right side of the odontoid peg and on the body, we're just talking about these are technical terms for the bones, which indicate possible scorching by fire. Remember the example we cited towards the end of our, our last podcast was a, a mastodon remains that also had evidence that looked like it was scorched by fire. The bones were scorched, actually, right? And, and the suggestion was that the bones were scorched when the flesh was still on the carcass, right? Which means you're talking about a pretty hot fire. Carbonized patches are present on the right side and on the body, which indicate possible scorching by fire. The distal end of the right humerus has been worn away and discolored to a deep or reddish brown, suggesting the effects of fire. The presence of carbonized, scorched, and charred areas on the axis and within the cancellous bones of the humerus indicates that fire had touched the bones. The most likely resulted from a forest fire. The lack of associated charcoal suggests water sorting of the bones and ashes. Now, right there, I think in that case, which can be uh, replicated many times over, we find the evidence of two, two things, two forces of nature at work, fire and water. Now, 
how does it end up in the gravel deposits? Well, those gravel deposits are the, re the, 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 the consequence of floods, giant floods, right? These gravel deposits that form these terraces are not being eroded or created today. They are fossil features in the landscape. The present rivers are merely wending their way through this ancient landscape and doing very little to modify it. But once you understand the genesis of these landscapes, you realize that they were created in a geological eye blink and that they were created under catastrophic circumstances, right? So here we now are finding these remains, these, skeletal, these skeletalized remains in these gravel deposits, and they show evidence of having been scorched by fire. So what we have here is evidence of fire and water, right? Working together. How do you explain it? How do you, what kind of a scenario, other than just some randomized imaginary scenario, which could possibly be credible within a singular instance, but when you have multiple instances where you have remains of, whether it's vegetation or animals that look like they have been scorched by fire, but they are now found in flood deposits, how do we explain that? Yeah, it doesn't doesn't seem like there would be any normal circumstances that would result in that, especially not when they're in the bottom of some massive gravel pit. Yeah, they're they're in they're being dug up from right. It'd be one thing if they were really close to the surface and their bones were scorched. But you know, yeah. like you could imagine that they were They had to have been burned before they were deposited, is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Because they're so deep in the gravel. Yeah. yeah. So the water came later and they were burned. So burnt. here I'll I'll I'll, I'll they, finish if they were burned that bad and they died on the surface, their, their bones wouldn't be all together in the, you know, they would have. Yeah, that's right. So you would say the bones would not be articulated. There you go. They Dis would in fact be disarticulated. disarticulated. Disarticulated, right. Yes. Now you can add this one to your vocabulary, Kyle, and you can pull it out every now and then when you need to impress people. Yeah. <laughs> you can refer to some, something, this or that being disarticulated. Like my vocabulary. <laughs> yeah. Or I was going to say perhaps like Russ is feeling a little bit disarticulated this evening. That's right. <laughs> Let me go on with this quote. Okay. The, it says that this most likely resulted from a forest fire. The lack of associated charcoal suggests water sorting of the bones and ashes. The wood ash and bone charcoal being carried further downstream. It must be concluded that the Cochrane bones derive from a number of individuals of five mammalian species and that they were all water rolled and carried downstream from where death overtook each animal before deposition in the gravel and sand beds. So they obviously weren't scorched by fire after they were water rolled and deposited deep in these gravel deposit. So they had to have been scorched by fire, probably killed by fire, then basically re moved and redeposited through floods that came subsequent to the fire. Uh, Randall, is there any dating on these bones? On this particular bones, I don't have the dating on this, but on a lot of them there are. And, it, and it, it's interesting that it seems like there are sort of a number of clustered dates we not only find this kind of evidence, um, most of it seems to be associated with the terminal extinction event at around 12 to 13,000. But we also find evidence that, for example, around 40,000 years ago, there seems to have been a massive event. You know, the, the, the Barasovka mammoth in Siberia apparently dates from about that time period. Although I don't know if any accredating has been done recently. Um, I think based upon stratigraphic context, perhaps, I'd have to go back and review, but, but there is um, evidence of, of more like episodic uh, type of episodes that could perhaps go back hundreds of thousands of years. The thing about the, what makes the Pleistocene Holocene event uh, the most significant is because it was the most severe. And as we've talked about, I think you'd have to go back a minimum of 3 million, maybe as many as much as 5 million years to find an equivalent extinction episode. Uh, as the one of, say, twelve to 13,000 years ago. We could call it the Younger Dryas extinction. <clears throat>
But 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 yeah, here here's an example. Okay, you asked about dating, Mike. So this was um okay, this was published in 1971, right? Now, so since then we've refined our dating. It's not going to completely rearrange the dates, although it could be a refinement of the dates. Um this is a mastodon bone age and geomorphic relations in the Susquehanna Valley, which is Pennsylvania, right? Yeah. Yeah. On August 10th, 1969, oh, there's that year again, we were given a bone that had been discovered 3.5 meters below the ground surface in a 6.2 meter gravel borrow pit being used for construction of New York Route 17 in southern New York. We have identified the bone as a pelvic fragment of a mastodon, and in obtaining a radiocarbon date, they came up with 13,320 plus or minus 200 years. But this, this uh, you know, testifies to the state of radiocarbon dating in 1971, because they go on to say virtually the entire specimen was sacrificed in order to obtain that date. A study of stratigraphic aerial relationships indicates the enclosing sediments to be of glaciofluviatile. Got it, my, uh, Kyle? Glaciofluviatile. <laughs> <laughs> so the deposits, the enclosing sediments uh, are glaciofluviatile origin deposited in a valley train when the ice front stood at the valley heads moraine position. Now, glacial fluviatile, just break it down. Glacial means glaciers. Fluvial means flowing water. So this is water flowing from melting glaciers, okay? It's just a long, you know, how many syllables did that have? A lot, all right? <clears throat> but basically that's what it means. Glacial glaciers, fluviatile flowing water, okay? Fluvial means flowing water. Uh, the ice front stood at the Valley Heads Moraine position. We're going to come back to that when we start talking about the, um, the Finger Lakes of New York, which is extremely interesting. Um, the site is in the valley of the Shamoong River, Bradford County, Pennsylvania, one kilometer southeast of the valley of Shamoong, New York. Of the 10 mastodon and mammoth localities south of the Finger Lakes in central New York, five are near the Shimong River in Shimong County and west of Shimong Village. Now there's a reason for that, and that'll become clear, I think, when we begin to look at the particular geomorphic and geological circumstances of these very interesting Finger Lakes, right? These five radial lakes that spread outwards, um, radiating from a, a central focus point in in uh, Eastern Lake Ontario. The name Shimong, get this, is derived from an Indian name, which means great curved bone, a reference to Indian discoveries of tusks in the region in the 1700s. Radiometric dating of a mastodon bone near Shimong, New York, helps define the final recession of the late Wisconsin Valley Heads ice in the Finger Lakes as occurring between 13,320 years ago and 12,600 years ago. So within that range, see, what's right in the middle of that? Younger Dryas boundary, right? And it marks the beginning of the recession, the melting back of the, of the ice in that region. Connection there? The, the ice melting, and, and so, okay, so now we have the ice melting, and apparently melting at such a rate that it's able to sweep over the land, scooping up enormous amounts of gravel, right? And in the process of scooping up those enormous amounts of gravel, also scooping up living animals and drowning those animals, sweeping those animals along, and their remains are now being found within those enclosing sediments that were deposited by extraordinary meltwater floods. So I have a question. Why sure. are all these extinctions, uh, are they associated with the end of the Younger Dryas, like the meltdown and not the beginning? 
No, most of them are associated with the beginning. This, okay. third, this, 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 this dating right here from 12,600 to 13,300, pretty much brackets, you know. And it's saying this is something that happened within that range, see. Because in 71, the, the, the margin of error of the dating is, an, is such that, that they're only going to say, well, it happened between 12,600 and 13,300 years. But of course, the, 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 the mean of those two is almost the younger driest. And okay, of course, when it begins. Okay. yeah, this, this, when it begins, right, exactly. So the black mat layer is uh, the, beginning. the beginning of the younger dryas. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. I thought it was the end. All right. No, Kyle, I'm glad we finally got that straightened out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, the this could have been. The beginning of it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then we talked last week about um, the uh, – the rapoon was it the rapoon um the uh i'm not sure how you pronounce it but r a p p u h n a a mastodon site in lapeer county michigan they found the bones of a mastodon uh in a detailed archaeological mapped field location um discovered oh by gottlieb rapoon in 1960, during the draining and clearing of a willow swamp in a small, shallow kettle hole depression within a cultivated field, do you know what a what a kettle hole is? No, no, don't recognize okay. it. Okay, okay, a kettle hole. This is what it is. You've got the glaciers melting down and and breaking up, right? I mean, you have to picture in your mind massive, stagnant amounts of ice, meltwater carrying icebergs and sediment, the water sweeps over the land, begins to, to lose energy, and as it does, it lays down its, its, its thick sediments of gravel and icebergs that will now be sit, sit in that gravel, right? So now the, gra the icebergs melt away, and because they've been sitting in the gravel, there's a natural depression or basin there that, that forms in the, the sediment. That can be gravel or it can be it can be glacial till, right? So now you have this. So so and when it melts, of course, then it leaves behind. It it fills that basin with water, and that is a kettle lake. Now, if the water evaporates away or drains away, it oftentimes will leave a low, kind of a marsh-like environment. It'll the basin will still be there. It might begin to get accumulate organic material. That, that begins to form peat. So it'll almost be like a, a low swampy area, area of, of peat, P-E-A-T, peat. Um, and that's very typical too, right? But it's still, it's genesis is basically the same. It's just that the subsequent uh, uh, forces that have acted upon it have, have created, you know, different types of, of phenomena today when we look at it. In one case, it may be a basin filled with a lake, but in another case, it may have become filled with organic material. You know, because it's low and swampy, it may be, it may hold uh, a lot of moisture, so you get a different kind of a, a, a vegetation growth than you would in the area around it. So that's basically what a kettle lake is, right? So um, what it's saying here is that the, uh, he was draining and clearing a willow swamp, there we go, in a small, shallow, kettle hole depression within a cultivated field. So now you can picture that. He's, he's farming around there, but there's this low depression um, with willow trees, presumably, and he's draining, draining it, right? Because um, it probably held water, maybe ephemerally, maybe it, maybe it might have not been standing water all year, might have been only... Uh, you know, in the spring with snow melt off or after rainstorms. I don't know. It doesn't give that detail. Um, so, um, so then in a systematic excavation of the site in 1965 and 1966, they recorded the location of all the recovered fossils. Turned out that the mastodon was an old male. Um, 
in any states. And I don't want to reiterate, we did talk about this a little bit last week, but this will help to tie what we're talking now. Uh, the bones of the feet were widely scattered. Many of them are charred in a manner which indicated that flesh and cartilage were present when burning took place. Now, it's not too much of a stretch of imagination to, to, to imagine that these animals, like this mastodon, was caught in an extraordinarily hot catastrophic fire that was then subsequently followed by a flood. And that would explain the taphonomic circumstances. Yeah. Better than anything else I could come up with. Yeah. Right. It's even more interesting because it, it's burnt while its flesh is still on it. Then it's carried into this enormous flood and then deposited underneath a block of ice. That's all there, you know, because it's in a kettle hole. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, and that would make sense too, in a way, because, you know, a lot of times these depressions, you go and you look at any flood, right? After, in the aftermath, or a rainstorm, in the aftermath, you're going to have puddling. You're going to have ponding in low areas, right? And, and in the aftermath of a glacial meltdown, some of these things will last for thousands and thousands of years. And so it's not to be unexpected that you might look in a low, boggy area and find in that area not only fluvial sediments, but animals that were, you know, drowned in the waters that created those deposits. See, so here we have a gravel, we have gravel pits, water lane, right? And in those gravel deposits, we find skeletal remains of animals, mostly the extinct animals. Now we find skeletal remains of, of living animals too, because a lot of them died, but just not to the point where there was no viable reproducible species left, you see. Just like, using, again, referring back to the example of the American bison. Um, you know, what was it they say? Just maybe 300 individual bisons left around the turn of the century, right? Down from millions. And yet the species has pretty much, with our help, has fully recovered. Of course, it was, it was through our instigation that the species, I say our, actually it, it was pretty much mostly the federal government who, under the, um, the advice of... Uh, Sher Sherman and Sheridan, who were generals of the victorious Union Army, you know, when, when, when the uh, Civil War was over and the South capitulated, you know, the North had this, now this big intact military, victorious military, and they had to find something for them to do. So they put them at the service of the railroads and uh, under, under the leadership of Philip Sheridan and, and, and uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, they developed this idea that, that the, that the, uh, Plains Indian tribes, which were obstructing their plan for these uh, subsidized railroads, were going to have to uh, somehow be eliminated. And the way they came up with was to destroy their economy, which was the, the American bison. So not only did they send out soldiers to slaughter the animals directly, they also put a $10 uh, uh, a bounty on, on the, um, the pelts the bison pelts. And wow. it was basically, and see, this is a story that we're not told generally because we're always given this picture of, you know, the rich guy at the back of the train shooting, you know, the buffalo down and, and, and all of that, but they don't tell you, well, it was a concerted effort to eliminate the species in order to destroy the Plains Indians. But that's, that's a digression there. Um, but I, I get mad every time I think about that. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But the point is, the bison got down to about 300 individuals. And then because of some farsighted humans, we need to save this species. And now it's, it's brought back and you can buy bison steaks at your local supermarket. Um, which, hey, if that's what it takes to bring the species back, I'm all for it. But the point is, if we were looking at this, the American bison from 10,000 years in the future, we could completely miss the fact that for, yeah, for a yeah. few decades there, the species came within literal hair's breadth of complete extinction. If those 300 individuals had succumbed, there would be no American bison at all today. See? So the, the, one of the points in that I'm trying to make here is even the species that didn't actually go extinct, right, undoubtedly would have suffered enormous losses. But just through the the vagaries of these kinds of events and the luck of the draw, some species survived and others didn't. And the ones that survived, it might've only been, who knows, a few hundred 
individuals left. But yeah, given, true. you know, once, once the environment stabilized, then they were able to replicate themselves and repopulate the species. Um, so yeah, so here we find another example of, of an individual animal. Its taphonomic circumstances are extremely interesting. We find the evidence of fire that's followed by deposition in, in floods. And, uh, and, then, and then again, this is, is, is interesting because the skeleton is disarticulated very much in the way of the Oralton Farms mastodon that we talked about, um, <clears throat> which showed all the evidence of, a, of an extremely uh, sudden and catastrophic demise, uh, you know, that it fell victim to some kind of extreme crushing force that literally flattened the, the poor thing out, you know, and, and literally sheared off where he was stepping. So you got to picture this mastodon is walking, right? He stepped down, he might weigh six tons, right? So he's stepping into on the soft earth, his weight is on his back foot. So his back foot has sunk into the soft ground. And at that moment, some force comes along and literally shears off the rest of the skeleton and leaves the foot embedded in the earth, right? So again, the taphonomic circumstances are what we need to be looking at here because you see, these event, these these examples that I'm citing here, there's there's nothing at all consistent about that, with the fat with the with the idea that they succumbed to human predation. Human predation has been the dominant idea for since at least the 1960s. That the 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 loss of these great megafauna is ultimately to be blamed upon Paleo Indian hunters, which we've talked about and we'll continue to talk about because um, as we learn more and more and more, the plausibility of that scenario diminishes to close to zero. So yeah, the skull was 20 feet away from the place where it should have been. It lay upon its base on the surface of the till. Um, at least three large pieces of it have been removed prior to the plowing and were found in undisturbed earth 20 feet from the skull in the area. It's almost as if his skull was crushed and pieces of the skull were. Or was it a result of the disarticulation was the result of, of, of a vigorous transport in swiftly moving water? Yeah, but wasn't, Problem, the, foot, wasn't the foot actually, there was a footprint underneath still, like it was still stepping in? <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was saying. It was stepping in its rear, I think it was the rear right foot, sunk into the ground. And right. that foot was still there. Right, on top of the print of the foot. It's not like the foot was just in the gravel somewhere, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Because the, 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 the ground surface was there. Right. And it was covered by this layer of peat. See, that's, that's the point. See? That's what, what could have done that. And then whatever, whatever took the foot off and move the animal 20 feet away is gone. Well, now this is, this is, this is a completely different example than I'm citing here now. Oh, okay. This one's in, in Michigan. Um, the Orton Farms was in Ohio, but they're, they're similar. They're parallel. I mean, in that, that both of them seem to have died under catastrophic circumstances. And neither of them show any evidence or indication that they were the result of human predation or hunting. Right. So, yeah. So then we have the uh, Panthera atrox, which is the Pleistocene lion-like cat. These huge, almost the size of a horse, some of them, the big males um, that were inhabitants of North America. Huge predators um, that could have easily eaten humans, puny little weak humans. Um, here's this report. Um, Again, going back to the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences, and I like to read that particular journal because it does cover a lot of the evidence being found up in Canada, which is the area that was pretty much mostly glaciated and where Bradley and I have done quite a bit of traveling and continue will continue to do so. This was um, published in 1971 by C.R. Harrington. He says, evidently, Panthera atrox, or the Pleistocene lion, like Pleistocene lion, probably conspecific with the extinct Eurasian cave lion, Panthera lea spalia, probably, you know, that they were cousins of each other. 
Most likely it entered North America from Eurasia near the close of the penultimate or Illinois glaciation, which would have been a much earlier glaciation several hundred thousand years ago, and was widespread in the southwestern half of the United States, reaching as far south as Peru during the last glaciation. The species also occurred in the unglaciated areas of Alaska and the Yukon Territory during the Wisconsin glaciation. The pl uh, Panthera atrox became extinct by the close of the last glaciation, which puts it right in the window that we're talking about here. Um, so fossil material referable to Panthera atrox has been discovered recently in deposits of the last interglacial age and later near Medicine Hat, Alberta. So this was perhaps even an earlier catastrophe. The specimen discussed here is interesting because it is relatively well preserved, is readily identifiable, and because it further extends the known northward range of the species on the Great Plain. The fossil was collected by Mr. Peter Kuhn and his son, Gerald, while they were shoveling gravel in a pit. One mile north of the Red Deer River on Highway 41 near Bindloss, Alberta. So the gravel pit is approximately 200 feet above the level of the Red Deer River. So that tells you right there, that gravel is deposited now by water. So that means that the water was carrying gravel at least 200 feet above the modern river. Uh, the specimen was discovered about three feet below the surface. In April 1970, the author collected phalanges and scapula fragments of an extinct small horse and tusk fragments of an elephant from the same gravel pit. But I'm guessing that, um, that this was probably a deposit of the, of the late Pleistocene rather than an earlier one um, because of the fact that, they, that these gravel hits three feet from the surface, that's likely more recent than going back to a previous interglacial. And then we have a interesting find in Mexico. This is a more recent one. This was published in 1998. Um, Cucurpe Sonora. Did we talk about this last week? Deep in rural cow, cow country on a dirt road connecting one farming village to another. History lay buried for more than 10,000 years. Beneath the packed brown dirt under the route crossed daily by pickup trucks, cattle cars, horses, and herds, archaeologists recently unearthed the skeleton of a mastodon. Lying on its side, it's more than six-foot-long tusks spearing the embankment. The mastodon remains are being called a Mexican national treasure. In, northern, in all of Mexico, northern Sonora has one of the richest deposits of fossil and historic artifacts. Petroglyphs and cave paintings are found across the state. So, and yes, we did talk about yeah, that last yeah. year. We did, right. And, but here's, here's the point, and it's, it is worth reiterating, okay? Um, the discovery of this mastodon, which lived at the end of the Ice Age, is significant, said the, the lead uh, scientist, uh, uh, the, a paleontologist. And this is a quote, to become a fossil, an animal has to be buried very quickly after dying and remain buried. I think that's the key takeaway point from this. Um, scientists believe that the Cucurpe mastodon died in a muddy bog and became covered with muck. So there you have in a muddy bog. So the bog is going to be in a low area where water subsequent in a flood will become ponded. Interesting stuff. And... Here's the Pawnee Hero Stories and Folk Tales, collected by George Bird Grinnell in 1889, right, Pawnee. So they believed that there were giant creatures that began to roam all over the earth. And the giant creatures gradually forgot about the creator. But being so big and powerful, they did whatever they wanted. After a while, they began fighting with each other to see who was the greatest and most powerful among them. This led to many fierce struggles in their constant fighting, tore up the forests, dug up the prairies, and knocked down mountains because they were so strong 
there was much destruction. Finally, Tirawa became angry with the giant animals, stretching out a hand over the land. Tirawa or Tirawa called on the waters to rise. Rain began to fall and water began to bubble up from deep in the earth. Rivers overflowed their banks in a great flood that spread across the land. Everywhere there was water. But the giant animals were tall, so at first they were not afraid. But then their feet began to stick in the mud and they sank into the soft ground. They tried to escape, but the more they struggled, the faster they went down until at last every one of them sank beneath the water into the mud. When Tirawa saw that all of them were finished, the god waved a hand over the land, making hot breezes blow and causing the sun to dry out the earth. And so um, now when the Pawnee walk along the riverbanks, sometimes they find giant bones sticking out of the mud. These are the bones from the animals that Tirawa drowned. They are there as a reminder not to forget the creator. Hmm. So there are many kinds of these legends that... That's really cool. That is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> that oh, yeah. sounds... I mean, it's the way it starts with the you know it's like it's very similar to the biblical stories of you know people got proud and started just doing you know just yeah not caring and so god wiped them out and there were giants on the face of the earth in those days yeah too. It's like, there you go there were giants <laughs> yeah so yeah there's i've collected a lot of these stories together we'll, we'll, we'll explore some of them because i believe these stories are provide important information and insight. It should not be just dismissed or ignored, which sort of has been the tendency. Yeah, so that's an oral tradition that's basically been carried on for 12,000 years. Something like that. Yeah. And of course, the, one, the critics will say, we, you, you, nobody's going to carry on an oral tradition for that long. Well, that's your assumption. Right. Based upon what? As... I mean, it's been shown that the that some Australian Aboriginal tribes have oral traditions about things that have yeah. been to be 50,000 years old. I mean, they talk about, uh, you know, so. Yeah. In the words of the, the great bard, I would quote as best I can, as far as the academics who dismiss these kind of stories out of hand, that they are, somehow not relevant, scientifically relevant to understanding these processes, I would merely say that, well, uh, man, that's like just your opinion. <laughs> that would be my response. The dude. Yeah. The great bard. That's right. <laughs> it's just an like imminent sage. Your opinion, man. <laughs> okay. I got a couple of cool photos to share here. Um, cool. We're already at an hour too, but oh, we are. Yep. We need to wrap it up then. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. You guys, I swear, you guys are <laughs> harsh <laughs> taskmasters. <laughs> you, get, you get me all wound up. I get get going, and then we the shut comes shut down. <laughs> you shut me down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Share here. Let's have a look. Wow. And this is the Clovis Mammoth Pit. We visited this. I don't remember what year. I'm sure Bradley does remember. What was that, about 2004? Um, at the Blackwater Draw site? Yeah. No, it was a lot more recent than that. It was probably... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, 14... <laughs> Oh, yeah, because this is already 2019, isn't it? Yeah, man. Oh, jeez. I get, I get off. I, I quite frequently get off by a decade or more and have you to were, stop and think. You were pretty close on the Bow River Valley, though. That, that was 99, though. Remember, you? that was the year when the Shaw paper and the Japanese guys came out. The back to Brett's was 99. So that's 99. when we were up there in the Bow River Valley, yeah. That's right. Okay. Right, because what I remember about that was we were going to go up there to find evidence that the source of the mega floods that produced the scab lands were up in the Canadian Rockies. And then just, just prior to us leaving, the paper comes out 
that suggests that the source of those floods was the Canadian Rockies. <laughs> so that was pretty exciting to me. Perfect timing. Yeah, pretty amazing. Of course, that's the Canadian geologists now, and they've got, there's this, we'll, we'll be talking about the Canadian geologists versus the American geologists here. Okay, but this is uh, the Clovis Mammoth Pit, and we'll, we'll be talking about the Clovis next week. And I'm sure when we have George Howard with us, he'll, he'll have some interesting things to say about this. But this was one of the first uh, excavations where the association of humans with extinct megafauna was found. And in fact, if memory serves me correctly, this particular um, instance of, of a mammoth burial pit uh, had a skeleton with an embedded uh, Clovis spear point in the rib cage. Well, which led to the supposition then that because we find one or maybe one more example of humans hunting mammoths, that then humans killed, hunted, them. killed them all. Yes. We'll go here. You can kind of get a sense of the pit that's being, Man. being excavated there. Um, of course, they've turned it into a little museum these days, which is pretty interesting. And, and in this next view here, what we're seeing, if this has come up yet, the black matte layer, which it's not very distinct because this has been excavated. But if you look down in the front layer here, these are bones of extinct animals, right, that are below this black matte layer. And these are bones of extant animals found above it. Wow. Here you can see there here here's that layer. This is the younger driest boundary layer. So down here is a bone deposit of extinct animals below that layer. So this is a so there's extinct mammals and Clovis artifacts below the black. Now because of the the blackness you'll notice the the lower levels here are dark gray as you get above them you, they get into this buff color. But yeah, the 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 the, um, <coughs> the black soot like material has has colored everything gray. Um, yeah, look at that though. That's the late great Russell Alt there with us. So that was that was two thousand eight, man. Now you were closer on that one. That two thousand fourteen must have been our second trip through there. But yeah, that was two thousand eight. Oh with yeah, Rusty. So yeah, the late Russell Alt. I don't understand what like so so the layer of extant fossils. Up here. What what episode was that? that caused well, I don't know, but it was an episode that wasn't enough to exterminate the species. Who knows? I you know, this is something I've wondered about. Could this possibly yeah. date to 11,600? Right. Yeah, the yeah. End. Wouldn't that be interesting if it did? Yeah. Hmm. And then at Murray Springs in Southern Arizona, you can see very distinctly that black matte layer. Yeah. And as it says in the um, previous caption here, extinct mammals and Clovis artifacts below the black matte layer, you find them below, uh, but no, uh, yeah, and let's see, extant or modern animal bones and no Clo Clovis artifacts above. So hmm. extinct mammals and Clovis artifacts are below the black matte layer, but not above it. And this is at the Murray Springs where you can really see distinctly the black matte layer. So the, below this is Pleistocene and below, above this is basically, well, there's the transition. This, yeah. this is the younger driest boundary right here. And it's at the bottom of this black matte layer where the fingerprints of the cosmic event have been found. And, uh, yeah, so here we go to the um, the idea. A carbon-rich black layer, commonly referred to as a black mat, with a basal age of approximately 12.9 thousand years has been identified at over 50 sites across North America. The age of the base of the black mat coincides with the abrupt onset of Younger Dryas cooling and megafaunal extinctions in North America. In situ bones, which means bones that were found in the site, of extinct mammals and birds and Clovis tool assemblages occur below the black mat, but not within it or above it. In this paper, we provide evidence for an ejecta layer at the base of the black mat from an extraterrestrial impact 12,900 years ago. So, 
this has been a very controversial idea. Uh, yeah. We're going to stop the share. But it's an idea that we should definitely be exploring in greater detail. Um, and so far, what seems to be happening is that the proponents of the Comet Impact seem to be winning. But they've met a lot of resistance. And a lot of this resistance has come from um, scientists or, that are promoting the idea of human predation. So think about that. You've got a group of scientists that have for years been promoting the idea of human predation, the overkill hypothesis that it was human hunters with spears that brought the entire species of, of mastodons and mammoths to extinction. And somehow all of these other species as well, but that's always left very vague. Um, and here is a typical um, response to this, to the, to the proposition that there could have been something else involved. And I, I know that this particular, this particular um, academic at the uh, University of California, Davis, who's been in the forefront of, of pushing the current, the idea of we're currently in the midst of a mass extinction equivalent to the great five. And exhibit A to support that assumption is the terminal Pleistocene megafaunal extinction. Get that, make that connection, right? So in the wake of the finding of extraterrestrial proxies at the bottom of this black mat, this is, this is typical of the response. A new claim that climate knocked off North American megafauna. This is the uh, press release uh, from October 25th, 2000, I believe, 7. He says, I wondered to post this link or not. The press release is bad-tempered to the point of malice contains unfounded accusations against opponents, and in discussing the North American extinctions, it, it ignores all the evidence of Pleistocene extinctions in other continents. Obviously, I think this is worse than useless in the sense that it drives science backward, not forward. But bad stuff happens, and you need to learn to recognize it. Now, this was, this was directed to his graduate students, right? We're now supposedly going to go out and, and help figure this all out. Um, and so bear in mind, this guy who wrote this, and I won't even mention his name, he's a professor, an academic, and he is a proponent of human overkill hypothesis. So here he's immediately characterizing this idea that it might have possibly been something cosmic, which is just almost like too exotic, too science fiction-y, too far outside the range of these guys to even contemplate that such a thing could be. Well, just as it was in 1980, when the Alvarez team proposed that the dinosaurs were taken out by um, a, a, of an impact, an extraterrestrial event. You had the same kind of response, except that response was actually more subdued for the simple reason that it did not have the political ramifications that this does. This comes into the scientific discussion loaded with political implications, right? If you're promoting the idea that humans are now precipitating a mass extinction, as great as the late Ordovician or the late Devonian or the terminal Triassic, right? Or the Permian Triassic, for God's sakes. Yes, it's being compared. We are in a mass extinction crisis right now that is, is as severe as the Great Five. Well, and then if that's challenged your question, then the precedent is invoked. And what's the precedent? Well, look what we already did to the Pleistocene megafauna, which proves, which makes our case, right? Yeah, so I oh, thought it would have been the man made climate change narrative that would have been the more powerful. Uh, factor in them, you know, wanting to reject the idea of an, a comet impact or an impact. Well, see, they're related. I mean, because yeah. again, the scenario is that humans are now basically dis literally destroying the planet. And right. of course, this claim is being made completely without any context, without any his 
without any geological historical context at all. Because the people that are making that claim have no understanding of what this planet has endured. And believe me, we're going to get into that in great detail so that people understand that, yeah, this planet, far more frequently than, than, than academics even like to recognize, gets its ass kicked. Yeah, well, that was pretty much, pretty much it. So we're going to pick this up with getting into the nature of the proxies, what this event could have been, and it is by no means cut and dried. There's still a lot of mystery surrounding it. And, but I guess of what I'm trying to make a point here is that we should not be dismissive of, of it. And this, of course, this goes back, the last quote, this, this, this guy goes on and he says, um, he says, yes, you read that correctly. He's talking about the, 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 the idea that a comet impact or an extraterrestrial impact might have been played a role in exterminating the megafauna, right? <clears throat> he says, yes, you read that correctly. More junk science. Life's too short to list the things that are wrong with this idea. And then I, I wrote, apparently life is also too short for the professor to list even one thing wrong with this idea. <laughs> uh, yeah. Perhaps he disputes the presence of microspherals, magnetic grains, fullerenes containing, co containing cosmogenic helium, soot, iridium, and other proxies for cosmic impact found repeatedly at dozens of Clovis sites around North America. Or could it be that he is biased by his adherence to an ideological agenda? Yeah. yeah. So in the in the ensuing years, uh, since that was written, a whole lot more evidence has accumulated, and we're going to get in, and we're going to look at this evidence, and we're going to try to see if we can't come to some deeper understanding of the nature of these events, and um, I think and that's a worthy goal. Yes, we're, we're gonna yes. we're gonna have some actual scientists, uh, geologists on here that that can tell us firsthand what they found. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to start with George Howard next week, who helped found the Comet Research Team. Great fella who's been in the forefront of this for, for years. And right. not the kind of guy to, to uh, cave in to some of these academics with their... Um, snorts of derision. <laughs> with their snorts of derision. Thank you. Yes, with their snorts of derision. So, uh, but the thing is, of course, there's a lot of academics too. I mean, this idea has, has emerged from hard scientific research, highly credentialed individuals. So it's just that you've got an idea here that doesn't fit some of the dominant paradigms that are entrenched actually into a political worldview. And that's, that's what we're basically up against, that the guys proposing the KT extinction event uh, when they first came out in 1980-81, they didn't have the political factor as strongly entrenched in the controversy as as this Younger Dryas impact is. And of course, you know, um, like now we see the 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 um, the response of the academic community to to Graham Hancock's most recent book. And I haven't had a chance yet to look at look at their you know, dis attempt to, to discredit him. Um, but I'm sure similar to the, um, the attempts in the past, basically it, it, it comes down to, we erect these straw men that straw man, and then the more vigorously we demolish these straw men, uh, the more it will give the appearance that we've actually done something here. Um, and then on top of that, we'll layer this cake, uh, we'll frost this cake with ad hominem its attacks yeah. and appeals to authority. And we'll, we'll, we'll rest on the assumption that the unwashed will, will buy into that and, and, and assume that our, we're, this, we have spoken and this is the authority. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting how this plays out. But the thing is, is that's why one reason why we have to avoid the woo. And we're, we're, <clears throat> we're kind of got a balancing act here. On the one hand, we have to avoid the woo. But on the other hand, we, we can't restrict ourselves because really the world is a pretty bizarre place. And we have to be open-minded enough <clears throat> to speculate. We have to be willing to speculate. But the speculation needs to be grounded in good science. 
and we have to be willing to adjust our, our models when, when new evidence emerges. Yep. All right. So yeah, we got a broad cool. avenue to continue on into the Younger Dryas boundary and the extinctions mm -hmm. and the climate change and the mass flooding and the ice age shifts and all, all that. But in the interim, sporadically, we're going to continue to uh, throw a few more uh, topics in about Atlantis. They'll continue to be follow up on that. Right. And then we are going to go through uh, eventually some of the questions and uh, the good comments that are coming in. So. Uh, Lots, lots to pile in these these hours. Yeah, yeah. And Brad and I have to catch up on our editing. <laughs> and I want to apologize also to uh, some of the people who are wanting a. Uh, one of the comments was that asking us to keep the RSS feed up to date with, with the, the YouTube. With the YouTube, and that is, I'm lagging behind Brad, so I'm trying to catch up to Brad, and Brad's trying to catch up to the show. <laughs> <laughs> it's true when we record the show. So um, it's slowly I'm trying to, happening. Yeah. yeah, it's slowly happening. I'm carving out more time. Um, get, I'm getting faster at the editing process. So working on it, folks. Yeah, lots of lots of personal things going on. And, uh, you know, we're all making a living on the side of all this. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're, we're getting there. It's holiday season, all, all that uh, we're putting in we're putting in time and it, it takes time. So we're, we're working on it. And we want it to get out there to everybody. Uh, we sure do, That's but right. we're, we're catching up. We're yeah, finding our we groove. Are, yeah. And we are reading comments I mean, Randall is paying close attention to the comments. So, uh, and so we are paying attention to what you guys say. It's just going, it's just taking our first priority is to get this, get the material recorded. Mm -hmm. That's number one priority is to get this, keep this going once a week as much right. as possible. Uh, once we're once we're totally caught up, then we'll be able to more uh, more smoothly integrate commentary into each individual weekly show mm -hmm. because it'll be timely. <clears throat> so uh, we thank everybody for their patience on that. We're still working on it. So, but in the meantime, you can still write us emails, which we will definitely read and eventually get to one uh, cosmography with a K one six one eight at gmail dot com. Support Randall and this podcast at uh, patreon dot com forward slash Randall Carlson. And thanks to everybody who has supported. That's right. Very much. Very much appreciated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. All right. I think that's a wrap for this week, folks. Can't wait to the next one. That's right. Jam on. George on. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> All right. Good night, guys. Good, Good night. night. Bam. Click. Great. Great show, Randall. Thanks. Fantastico. <laughs> This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast.